Hey there. Welcome everyone to our webinar, Introducing Cooperatives. Um, this is part two of our webinar series, um, introducing the um, solidarity economy in the context of the Asian American experience. Um, so my name is Yvonne and we're joined today by um, three amazing speakers, um, well, including Parag, who's also a facilitator. But in terms of our agenda for today, um, first, we're going to start with um, an introduction. I'm going to introduce our lovely speakers. Um, we're going to secondly review the solidarity economy framework that um, the speakers in our first webinar talked about, Julia Ho and Emily Kwano, um, because we really want to place cooperatives are, are, are an important part, but it's, it's a piece of the um, total framework. Um, and then next, we'll have one of our speakers, Mai Nguyen, who's a board member of the U.S. Federation of Worker Cooperatives, um, give an introduction about cooperatives and talk more in depth about um, agricultural and producer cooperatives, um, followed by Ann Thu Nguyen from um, Democracy at Work Institute, who's going to talk more about worker cooperatives as well as um, the, the cooperative ecosystem and value supply chains. Um, we're going to uh, then um, cap it off with discussion and Q&A and a closing. Um, so thanks everyone for joining today. Um, so again, this is um, the second webinar um, that's part of our five part webinar series. Um, so we had our first one in uh, March where we did an introduction to solidarity economy. Um, and this one is an introduction to cooperatives. Um, if you join us in May, we'll go more into the nuts and bolts mm -hmm. of um, how to start a cooperative, governance and accountability, finances, and also um, deciding on a legal entity. Um, in September, we'll talk about, we're going to take a break for the summer. And then in September, we're going to talk about um, how do you convert existing businesses into cooperatives? Um, and how do you support existing businesses who want to collaborate in a cooperative manner? Um, and then last in October, um, we have a session on incubating cooperatives. Um, and this is specifically um, geared towards community organizing groups in Asian American communities who want to use cooperatives as both a community wealth building model um, as well as a leadership development tool. You can find out more about each of our webinars on our website, which is solidarityresearch.org forward slash webinars. Um, and we also just want to thank our partners in this webinar series, the UCLA Asian American mm -hmm. Studies Center and also um, national capacity. So in terms of our um, speakers, um, so first we have Mai. So Mai serves on the board of the U.S. Federation of Worker Cooperatives. They own and operate an organic farm and were the cooperative development specialist at the California Center for Cooperative Development. Now, Mai is an organizer for the National Young Farmers Coalition. They specialize in agricultural and worker cooperatives and primarily work with immigrant and small scale farmers to create cooperative alternatives to the conventional food economy. Um, and our second speaker is Ann Fu. She's the director of special projects for the Democracy at Work Institute. She develops markets and opportunities for collaboration between cooperatives and cross sectoral allies including the development of a value chain within the textile and fashion industries. Born and raised in Tampa Bay, Florida to Vietnamese refugee parents, Ann Thu earned her BA at Georgetown University and her JD at University of Texas School of Law. Um, and then joining us as both a facilitator and a speaker is Prague Kandar. He's the founding principal of Gilmore Kandar LLC. It's a law firm focused on legal policy and advocacy tools to advance economic justice, racial equity, and social transformation. He teaches at George Washington University Law School and is the co-founder of Baltimore Activating Solidarity Economies and the Asian American Solidarity Economies Network. Um, and uh, my name is Yvonne. I'm the co-founder and research director of Solidarity Research Center, which is a worker self-directed nonprofit that advances solidarity economies. I also serve on the board of the U.S. Solidarity Economy Network, and um, I'm the activist and residence fellow at the UCLA Asian American Studies Center. So um, just to recap 
um, a little bit about the broader framework of solidarity economy um, in which we're placing um, forms such as cooperatives. Um, so in our, in our first webinar, um, we had Julia Ho of Solidarity Economy St. Louis, Louis and um, Emily Kawano of um, the US Solidarity Economy Network um, talk about the solidarity economy. So there were sort of three elements to um, their definitions. First, that it's a bold and transformative vision for a new economy. It's not just simply a reform of our existing system of capitalism. Um, secondly, that equity is a core principle and um, radical inclusion is a, a, is a key piece. So um, in order for it to be a solidarity economy, it has to be inclusive, um, specifically you know, for, uh, of indigenous people and communities of color. Um, and then also that um, Mother Earth has rights in the economy and um, you know, um, needs to have her rights respected. So as you can see from the diagram that we have up, um, the solidarity economy is, um, is a really broad framework that touches upon all the different stages of the, of the process of production to consumption to surplus, sur surplus allocation um, and you know, really values the things that we have in common, which are at the center, um, which are community, you know, energy, the commons, um, shelter, and so forth. Um, and cooperatives are definitely a piece of that in terms of all the different stages. Um, and then next, Prague is going to talk about some of the examples that exist in other parts of um, the diaspora. Uh, thank you very much, Yvonne, and thank you all um, for joining us. Uh, it's wonderful to have these uh, really outstanding uh, panelists, really excited. So we're just going to take a couple of minutes um, right now. Um, actually, um, the um, the notion of, of cooperativism um, is uh, one that I mean I like to say that you know uh, humans wouldn't exist without cooperativism, um, and so um, uh, you know traditional societies and communities around the world um, have had um, cooperative uh, examples of, of cooperatives uh, in in many many ways. And so really briefly, just um, for some context in terms of Asia. Um, Farmer cooperatives and, and farmer credit unions are extensive and commonly known in many communities throughout Asia. Um, for example, the Korean agricultural uh, cooperatives consist of 2.4 million farmers and about 1,220 member cooperatives uh, with one sort of overarching apex federation called NACF. Um, one characteristic of Korean um, agriculture co-ops is they're multi-purpose organizations. Um, so they have marketing business, um, banking business, and also some extension services. Um, in Korea, they operate more than 5,000 bank branches um, nationwide with uh, currently about 32 million customers, which constitutes 67% of the total population of Korea as their customers. So it's actually the agricultural co-ops uh, constitute the biggest domestic financial institution in Korea. Um, examples like this are actually um, you know, pretty prevalent and, and um, so we won't go through everything right now. Um, but uh, this is just a way to, to get a sense um, of, of context in, in, you know, in other parts of the world and in Asia as an example. Um, with worker co-ops, um, while still kind of a growing sector and we'll hear a lot more um, now in the United States, they have a rich and deep history in parts of Asia. And just as an example, um, in India, the India Coffee House, uh, which is a network of well-known coffee um, uh, establishments that came from those stalls, uh, coffee stalls, uh, in uh, after independence are actually all worker owned co-ops. Um, and uh, they're, they're very proud of the fact that they're worker owned. Uh, Dira Lungal uh, Labor Contract Cooperative Society, the uh, ULCCS in, southern, in the Southern Indian state of Kerala is a 2000 plus member uh, worker owned construction company that's been around for 90 years um, and takes on many projects throughout uh, the the state um, and has been very clear about um, workers' rights and, and uh, labor standards um, and kind of set the tone um, uh, in that state. Um, both projects have book length uh, monographs about their histories, challenges, and what they represent locally, um, regionally, and for cooperatives generally. Um, these are just a couple of small examples. I mean, actually not small, but a couple of examples 
Um, if we could just click to the next slide. Um, for more examples, um, if you uh, take a look at the Asian Solidarity Economy uh, Coalition, uh, you can find this website on uh, ripus.org, um, which was mentioned in our first webinar. Um, promoting the social solidarity economy in Asia is about relearning the cultures of solidarity in these territories. It's revaluing the traditional norms while accepting and learning from more modern and innovative experiences of, of the social solidarity economy, not only from Asia, but around the globe. And so there are examples in, in many, many uh, nations and also traditional and indigenous societies, um, just recognizing that the nation state always, isn't always the, the best um, way to capture what's happening, of partic particularly you know, within these contexts where there's so many communities uh, within any um, uh, nation. So that's just a little bit of context about Asia and, and we really encourage you to look deeper. Thank you. And we just wanna pass it on to Mai. Hi, um, yeah, this is mine. <laughs> and um, uh, I was a co-op developer, as Yvonne mentioned, and I'm based in California, where uh, whenever I talk about co-ops, uh, people imagine this image, where they're like, oh, so you work with people who just hang out all the time, and they're having a good time with each other, and um, that cooperation to a lot of people means um, Kind of being a part of the social group um but as um parag says you know the the cooperative structure um a system of um working together has existed um across societies throughout time and um in more formal ways than just um holding hands dancing around in a circle um so next slide Yvonne. And in particular, I wanna talk about um, cooperatives as an actual business structure. Um, and this definition was um, created by my colleague at the Center for Cooperative Development. And I found it to be very useful for really just distilling a lot of um, the core concepts for a cooperative business as distinguished from kind of an informal cooperative. So it is a business. Thus, one that you actually um, file with the state. So you incorporate um, as a cooperative, and this varies from state to state. Some states actually have cooperative statutes um, and some don't. So depending on where you are, you would need to look into that. Um, but in any case, you would form a business and that business provides a service to its members. So, um, just to break that down a little bit more, providing this service um, in say like a consumer co-op or food co-ops or agricultural co-ops, there's a specific um, task that it's trying to fulfill. So for food co-ops, it's oftentimes, or it has been about bringing um, fresh produce, bulk um, foods from local farms, having that direct connection and kind of eliminating a lot of the, the middle people who kind of reduce the transparency of that food chain. Um, or um, for a housing co-op, it's to provide housing. So it's a specific service. And some other outcomes may um, be derived, right? So by living together, maybe you discover, hey, we a lot of us have young children and we want to coordinate together to have childcare. And so that could be a cooperative endeavor, but the actual cooperative business entity is providing that housing service. And then it's providing it to a specific membership. So um, for say like a food co-op, there's the membership that votes, that determines the, the board, um, that determines the values and principles, and that food co-op may, um, you know, have customers who are non-members, but those members don't have voting power and don't have larger control of the business. And this at cost piece, um, uh, so I just want to distinguish that co-ops are businesses and therefore are for profits, but to say that it's at cost is to um, highlight that you're again eliminating a lot of middle people, a lot of brokers in the process of um, receiving services. So this is the definition that I'd like for us to work with moving forward um, 
And, and if other people ask you what a co-op is, I hope this is helpful for you to, to have a succinct definition. Um, next slide, please. So some core components of co-ops across the board is that um, for each member, they have one vote. So that doesn't change um, in proportion to your equity or investment, right? So in like a corporation, the more, um, you know, stock shares you hold, the greater power of your vote. And you might not even work at that corporation um, ever or in the future, but just by having a lot of stock in it, um, it raises the uh, power of your vote. But that's not the case in the co-op. If you are a member, then you have one vote. So it's a democratic process. Um, profits are distributed in proportion to use. So this is really key to consider because I have, get a lot of questions about people saying, well, you know, what if someone is slacking off? Are they um, getting the same amount of profits as everybody else? Um, like, how do you account for like free riders? And it's just important to consider that in a co-op, I mean, people are going to be compensated um, in the case of like a worker co-op, they'll be compensated through their wages. Um, but if someone's part-time and someone else is full-time, in the profit distribution, it will be according to um, how much effort they put in. Um, another piece is that co-ops um, avoid double taxation. Um, you're either taxed at the co-op level or the individual level, um, and not both, as opposed to any corporations or other uh, business entities. Um, Again, there's a limitation on non-member business because you want the members to have as much control as possible. And so the more non-member business you have, um, you end up losing your autonomy. Um, and the last piece, I'd like to highlight that this cooperation between cooperative businesses, you know, in a world where there is a lot of competition, one that sort of can impede progress, this cooperation between cooperatives really allows um, this democratic ownership um, model to grow and for more people to be able to learn from each other. Next slide, please. So I just wanna give a brief outline of the different kinds of co-ops that exist. Um, we're not going to go into detail about all of them, but um, I also often hear, you know, like, that co-ops are really rare, like I don't see them around, and sometimes we just don't know that they're around. So these are um, some that I just wanted to pick out from different sectors. So REI recently rebranded themselves um, and outed themselves as a, as a cooperative, so they're a consumer co-op. Um, there's um, the People's Organic Food Market, so that's in San Diego, and they're one of many um, food grocery co-ops, um, and there's a national network. So if you're ever interested in starting one, there is a, a national network um, that can help support you. Credit unions are all cooperatives. I don't know why they don't call themselves that, but all credit unions are co-ops. And so um, in that network, they've worked together to reduce fees. So if you go to a 7-Eleven, the ATMs are usually part of the co-op network, and so your fee is waived for um, for making a withdrawal, um, which is really helpful for me because I spend a lot of time near 7-Elevens apparently. <laughs> um, then there are artisan co-ops. Again, different statutes um, than other types. Um, that's when artists come together to sell their goods. Housing co-ops I've mentioned, and then SunSweep is an agricultural co-op. So um, for each of these different types, Again, they have different statutes, and those statutes, again, vary from state to state. So if you are interested in starting a co-op, um, just be sure that if you're looking for models that they're within your state, or if you're looking at other ones, just uh, you know, ensuring that they can cross over. And this is also where um, attorneys, perhaps like Parag, <laughs> could help you. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so I'm just going to go deeper into the agricultural co-ops. Um, these are some really large ones. We call them century co-ops. Um, well, especially Blue Diamond and Sunkist because they've been around for 100 years. Um, 
and you know they they are very well known household names. Um, but I what, the reason why I want to highlight them um, is that it just really is a testament to the power of co-ops um, throughout time. Also that the American agricultural landscape is um, pretty much built by cooperatives, by farmers in rural areas, having to bring their goods together to a centralized place so that people could buy it. And that's what a lot of these agricultural co-ops do. Um, and the other reason why I'm bringing them up is because the decision-making model is transferable to, to many different types of cooperatives. Um, so next slide, please. So um, I understand that in coming sessions, um, governance will be explained in greater detail, but I just wanted to give you a sense of this basic structure um, so you can see how in a co-op, it's different than say for a corporation or other entities. So you have a membership. Um, so say all of us on this uh, webinar, we wanted to start, um, we're all we're all farmers. We're all growing. What's a cool, fun thing to grow? We're growing star fruit. <laughs> we're growing star fruit, and um, and so as a membership, um, we decided that we wanted to be able to um, aggregate our star fruit so that it can easily go out to market, so that each of us individually doesn't have to take care of. Um, uh, shipping it out to customers, identifying customers, creating a whole marketing plan. And so um, what we do is we elect board of directors and the board then um, consists of all these different positions. And they really um, ensure that the co-op is meeting our needs and they end up hiring the general manager who then hires employees. Right, so the farmers aren't the ones having to go do the deliveries, having to come up with um, fancy graphic designs for marketing. Instead, um, the farmers can keep farming, but then there's a system of accountability so that um, the business uh, and the market is serving the farmer's needs. Um, and then just a so, a little, so this also mirrors the food co-op um, structure where the customers who shop at the food co-op elect a board of directors who ensure the policies um, uh, conform to the membership's needs. Um, and the membership attends at least an annual meeting to um, vote on policies, any new bylaws. Um, but the board of directors are the more frequent point of contact for the staff. So if you go to a food co-op um, and you're a member and you're interacting with the employees, well, they are um, making the place function, but the employees are not directly accountable to the um, membership or not um, like, so if you were a customer, you wouldn't be able to go to a food co-op. And then if you had a bad experience, immediately fire the retailer in front of you. Yeah, you have to still go back through this uh, series of connections. But ultimately there is um, the connection of accountability and transparency through these entities. Next slide, please. So um, I'm not really gonna go too deep into my own, um, co-op, which is where um, I share grain growing and cleaning equipment with other farmers. But I do want to um, highlight that in this equipment sharing model, um, that's transferable to multiple communities, right? If you are a community that wants to share assets, um, that you can form a cooperative to buy tools, um, equipment, cars, um, so there's so many possibilities of what you can share as a way to build community wealth, especially in low resource um, populations. And, um, and, the, and then again, that model of like, there's a membership that buys in, there's a board of directors that ensures that the structure um, and policies 
uh, reflect the membership's desires and that there are people who can execute the work. So say um, that you want to have a tool lending library and there are some people who would actually use those tools, they'd be trained and but they're accountable to the membership. So um, that's just the really brief version. <laughs> um, next slide, please. Um, so it's something I do want to go into a little bit deeper is um, it's this example of this high desert jujube cooperative where um, they're in the Lucerne Valley of um, California. If you're unfamiliar with that area, it's it's a desert <laughs> and as um, their co-op indicates. And um, it's kind of just, it's about an hour and a half north of Los Angeles. Um, and so it's the only place that Korean immigrant farmers um, could find uh, available land. And the issue, of course, is that they're far away from the larger Korean population centers. Um, they're growing jujubes, um, which are pictured here. I hope you're familiar with them, but if not, they are um, a uh, prized and culturally significant fruit for a lot of um, uh, East, Southeast Asians, and all the way also to through to Turkey. So um, they wanted to grow these fruits in the desert, and they actually grow really well and um, can nearly be dry farmed. But um, they couldn't get assistance from the USDA, from um, technical assistance providers, because they were seen as a small crop. Um, the technical assistance providers are mostly um, Euro-Americans who are unfamiliar with this fruit and so did not see the, um, the importance or necessity for developing these crops. But these farmers, um, by coming together, next slide please, um, they, there were about 80 farmers in this area. They formed a cooperative so that um, they could be really taken seriously for their aggregated um, acreage. So for one farmer, they might only have 10 acres, but with 80 farmers, so then they have you know 800 acres, um, which really then tipped the scale so that USDA started helping them. Um, they also reached out to the California Center for Co-op Development where I was working, and we worked with them to um, get more um, uh, uh, organic certification trainings, food safety trainings, and to understand the regulations and certifications that were out there that they needed to comply with. Um, so in terms of, of being a minority, um, in terms of their crops, but also their population and being an English limited group, um, by forming a cooperative, they really were able to leverage um, the skills within their cooperative, but also to have um, a presence to then garner more resources. And of course, you know, beyond these practical um, advantages, next slide, please. There's also the social benefits of um, like all this food was made by that woman in the middle with the pink apron um, and uh, and also two other women and they made all these foods with that have jujubes inside so <laughs> there's also just the community benefit of um, you know continuing to uh, retain community practices and to celebrate the the creations that um, were coming out of their farm work Next slide, please. Um, lastly, I want to mention that I also was working with an Ume cooperative, um, also in a proximate area to where they were. And um, while they were also able to gain a lot of resources through that process that I mentioned, um, a key struggle for them was that for Ume, it's a very short season crop and the fruits need to be used right away. They're perishable as opposed to jujubes, which can be preserved, they can be dry, dehydrated. And so um, for a crop that's short season and perishable, the issue is that for um, selling it to market, it's hard to get 
to a younger generation where people are um, less familiar with um, preserving ume. They don't make time for it in a time where people eat out way more than they did before. Um, so for me, you can see in this photo, I got together with um, several um, Asian American uh, serving nonprofits and we had like an ume making preservation day. And so I think this just relates back to the importance of still being connected to um, communities and, and also furthering that sort of lowercase c cooperation, even though we might have these cooperative businesses surrounding it, we still need a system of cooperative support to really um, further the cultural practices and to retain the relevance of the businesses themselves. Um, next slide, please. And I just wanted to wrap up with some resources for you all. Um, so Cooperation Works is a network of um, co-op developers and there's a map below from their website of where they're located and I just highly encourage that you reach out to a co-op developer to understand what um, steps are next or for help and are helpful for you um, I didn't mention earlier but like a lot of the work that I was doing was through the federal socially disadvantaged groups grant um, which um, enables uh, co-ops that are run by farmers of by people of color um, and also um, co-op development centers that are working with people of color um, to develop cooperatives and then there's also some upcoming conferences one hosted by the center for cooperative development and the other one by both the u.s federation of worker co-ops and the democracy at work institute where Anpu is so I'll, for that i'll pass it on to Anpu. Thanks, and thanks, Mai. And if I could just say, we will share these um, list of upcoming events on our webpage um, and also follow up by email as well. I just want to remind folks before Anthony starts that um, we have a Q&A panel. So if you have any questions, you can ask there. OK, great. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Great to have you here and awesome turnout. Um, so my name is Antun Nguyen. I am Director of Special Projects at Democracy at Work Institute. My work includes um, value chain creation in the textile industry and some exploring with the food industry as well. And um, also I do, I'm based in here in New York City um, and a lot of my work uh, in New York City is uh, with the uh, city's council funded worker cooperative business development initiative, which is the largest municipally funded um, cooperative uh, program in the US. Um, it's, uh, we've received funding from the city at about uh, nine million dollars in the past four years um which has helped uh, contribute significantly to the growth of worker co-ops in new york city um, in the area of up to uh 80 cooperatives so next slide please i'm going to get um start a little bit with uh, a, a primer on worker cooperatives so as my spoke earlier about what cooperatives are um, the definition of providing um, members uh, benefit um, at cost services. Um, worker cooperatives, the membership itself consists of uh, the workers. So um, with agricultural cooperatives, the members are the farms, um, the farmers. Um, for the worker cooperatives themselves, it's the people who are working in the business. Um, the workers, the worker members share ownership, they benefit from the business, and they govern the business democratically. So it is governed under the principle of one worker, one vote. Again, profits are based uh, proportionally based on how much people work. Um, and democratic governance can take many forms, just as we have a lot of different democratic governments throughout the world. Um, the same applies to worker cooperative businesses. So you can have everything from representative elections of a board that then hires managers to run a business, and you see this um, often in large cooperatives and large worker cooperatives, um, to a direct governance model where the members take part in uh, all major decision making processes. So usually when people think of like a collective or a worker cooperative that, you know, everybody is having um, a decision, like has some decision making authority, that's that's more of a, you see that much more often in smaller cooperatives. Whereas larger cooperatives, like for example, Mondragon, the largest one in the world at, um, at about, I think it's like 80,000 people working at Mondragon now. Um, it's run basically like a corporation, except that the, it's worker owned and uh, everyone has a share and a vote and they vote through for um, management through the board. 
So next slide, please. So here are some examples of worker cooperatives that are um, older and uh, more prominent in the U.S. These are large worker cooperatives. The Cheese Board Collective has been around for almost 50 years now. Um, Isthmus is another large cooperative. Rainbow Grocery is another famous worker-owned food cooperative. Most food cooperatives are actually consumer cooperatives. Rainbow Grocery is among the few uh, food cooperatives in the U.S. that is worker-owned, and it's based in San Francisco. And Design Action Collective is another cooperative that is made up of graphic designers um, and uh, professional uh, UX web designers, also based in the Bay. These worker cooperatives are um, kind of come out of what we think of the worker cooperative movement within the past 50 years, which is kind of countercultural, primarily white, primarily middle class professionals who are um, using business as a way to sort of uh, create something different, to, to lead to have a social purpose and a mission. Um, but it's involved since then. Uh, next slide, please. So this started changing in the late 80s with the, um, with the, uh, the creation of Cooperative Home Care Associates in New York City. CHCA is now the largest cooperative in the worker cooperative in the U.S. It has 2,000 workers, <laughs> about 1,000 of them, half of them are worker owners. It is approximately 98% um, women of color, immigrant women of color, to be specific. Um, and spaced in the South Bronx. Um, it was established in 1986 and it was a real break in the trend of this kind of like white middle class, a little bit countercultural, if not a lot countercultural. And it signaled the beginning of worker cooperatives doing something else um, and specifically starting to focus on immigrant and communities of color and low income communities. So what CHCA has been able to do is it's transformed the home care sector in New York City. Um, to improve wages and the quality of work. Um, home care has traditionally been very exploitative, low wage, um, predominantly immigrant, predominantly women of color, and just like a hard business to be in. What CHCA did was show a model and a pathway to something else, that actually it could be dignified work and you can make a good living, and that there are ways to improve, to lift up the entire sector through starting a good business. Um, they have a not, they also, they, through their success, they've been able to establish a nonprofit arm called PHI, which nationally provides training and education to elder care and home care professionals and seeks to impact the home care industry nationwide. So PHI is like consulting on projects in Washington um, and uh, connected to SEIU and uh, the, the possible establishment of a home care cooperative there. Um, and uh, on the West Coast, um, as well as in other parts of the country. Next slide. So this leads us to Asian American led worker cooperatives that have arisen in the past decade or so. They kind of, they come out of the CHCA um, model of using worker cooperatives to support communities that have been left out of the economy. Um, we see, for example, Maharlika and Courage Home Care Cooperative, which both came out of um, worker centers. Um, Maharlika came out of the Damayan Migrant Workers Association in New York City, and Courage Home Care Cooperative came out of the Filipino Worker Center. Both of them come out of a rich tradition of um, Filipino worker organizing in the U.S., and they're both operating within traditionally low-wage industries. Um, Maharlika is cleaning and Courage Home Care and home care, obviously. Um, also, we have uh, with Veggie Farmers Cooperative and um, the youth-owned cooperatives uh, that are part of Viet Lead, cooperatives that come out of the Vietnamese um, refugee and immigrant communities. So Veggie came is um, a product of uh, Mary Queen of Vietnam CDC in East New Orleans, um, and it came into being as a result of the BP spill uh, in, Nor in uh, the Gulf spill in 2010, when a lot of fisher folk lost their jobs because of the, of the oil spill. So they came together um, they, and with the support of Mary Queen of Vietnam CDC, they were able to start farming cooperatively um, and uh, sell vegetables and offer opportunities for work in what is otherwise a uh, food desert. Um, Wish was 
is another cooperative. It's based in New York City. The founder is Indian and she's working in a predominantly Bengali community. Most of the women are DV survivors. They um, live in communities where they have limited mobility um, and limited language skills. And so they created a sewing cooperative which allows them to work at home and to work um, with more unconventional hours than they would otherwise be able to. Um, all of this is to say that these are cooperatives that like have arisen um, as a need. They're not necessarily coming out of this kind of uh, what we think of as like, you know, this very movement oriented sort of a little bit of kumbaya um, that we sort of, you know, traditionally think of when we think of solidarity economy organizing or um, worker co-ops in the U.S. It's coming out of a different need, which is like the, the need to in um, communities of color and um, Asian American immigrant communities to survive. And then there's one other that um, isn't on the page, but um, is Hmong uh, American Farmers Association, which is based in Twin Cities, and they are helping Hmong farmers um, work land and sell together. Um, so again, like they all, they're all connected in terms of like getting people access to, to our economy. So next, next slide. So with all of these, the rise of all of these different cooperatives, these new cooperatives that don't come from, um, you know, communities that have resources, cooperative ecosystem building has become quite important in order to make sure that these um, cooperatives not only survive, but also thrive and scale. So in the past few years, and the New York City example is, is the most prominent example of that, there's really been um, a move to uh, build ecosystems that allow for cooperatives just to flourish and to scale. So that includes everything from technical assistance um, provisions to uh, developing cooperative developers, which is what Dow we does like we provide best practices and we develop developers um, nonprofits that are interested in worker cooperative development as part of a workforce development tool um, to policy work to financing worker co-ops it's still extremely difficult to finance worker co-ops because banks do not know what worker co-ops are and um, usually to get a loan you need to get all of the owners to sign off and if you have 20 worker owners and they're all immigrants who may or may not have credit it's a little bit difficult to do so creating finance finance mechanisms and um, educating folks on like what are the special needs for financing worker co-ops um, and then getting into things like business support, advocacy to support worker co-ops um, and cooperatives generally and then also changing culture um, people don't know what worker co-ops are. They don't know what co-ops are. People think of it in a very like, you know, in New York City, people think housing co-op and they think of expensive apartment that is very hard for me to get into um, without understanding the underlying reason that these were created, which was a lack of housing and that there's like a, a social movement that underlies it. So, you know, connect creating these like cultural um, moments. And I think one of, we, we live in one of those cultural moments. Um, where cooperativism is seen as important to creating a better society and um, offering means to engage that and for us to be more involved in it, regardless of what community we come from. So um, next slide, please. And as part of cooperative ecosystem building in a more uh, granular level is creating cooperative value chains. So with my value chain work, my focus is on creating value both for consumers, because we live in a consumer-oriented society, it's the whole business customer is king kind of idea, um, and then also creating value for cooperatives as well. Um, principle six is of uh, the seven cooperative principles. It's about cooperation amongst cooperatives. So what does that mean? That can mean, you know, providing support. That, to me, means buying from each other and sourcing from each other. I think that's like the kind of fundamentals of creating a solidarity economy is, is that kind of uh, support. And using the value chain model in order to facilitate this. So it's a, when we think of like value chains, we think of like a traditional supply chain, which is like getting a prop, creating a product, let's say apples, having it from farm A distributed, getting to a warehouse that's owned by say a cooperative and then distributed through, um, you know, 
in, in food co-ops, it's usually UNFI because they monopolize the, the industry and then finally getting a food cooperative and then getting to you. Um, what we're thinking about is like, how can we insert cooperatives into these spaces so that we're not just like getting a product from point A to point C, but also creating value where you know that the product that you're getting is a great product, that it's ethical and that um, it's worth paying an extra $5 for because it's not cheap. Um, and the, it's less about, it's less about like the cheapness and the quickness of the product that you're getting, but more of the experience. Um, so examples that, that like we know about that are, that are very successful is equal exchange and agriculture. Um, they're the value chains that they created in the coffee and chocolate industries in the eighties and nineties. And now with, um, other commodities like bananas and olive oil are a great example of a successful value chain. So they source from agricultural cooperatives, um, coffee, bananas, um, chocolate, and then it's distributed through equal exchange, which packages, finishes the goods, um, markets them, and then ends up usually in your hands, usually through a food cooperative. So there is this process of this is all ethically um, sourced and created and um, managed, and it gets to you, and you know you're having a great product, and you're willing to spend an extra four dollars for it um, because you know you're contributing to this. Um, to the solidarity economy in, in a very micro level. And the same, and the project that I'm working on is in the textile industry. So I have been working with um, Opportunity Threads, which is a primarily Mayan Guatemalan um, run and led worker cooperative in, North, in Western North Carolina um, that sews um, soft goods. So I've been working with them on creating a bag um, that's sourced domestically from uh, domestically uh, woven fabric and then um, manufactured at Opportunity Threads and then finished um, screen printed by worker cooperatives, um, also Latino led worker cooperatives here in New York City and um, across the country. And then finally getting to um, sold through consumer cooperatives. So next slide, please. So how does this all relate to our experience, experiences as Asian Americans and how does our experience as Asian Americans relate to like the cooperative development, cooperative development principles that I just spoke about? Um, ecosystems, um, what we see like in immigrant communities like we've grown up in um, where there's you know, been lots of segregation and also a lot of solidarity and mutual assistance as a result of that. Um, these are, there's a lot, there's a lot we can learn how people support each other, whether it's financially, whether it's through providing mutual assistance, housing, and so forth, that we can, um, you know, that can be practiced in, like, with cooperative development as well, and insert cooperative development within these, these spaces. Um, sharing resources and capital, um, cultural mindsets, I think it's really, you know, it, like, it's, it's pretty, like, easy to see that we live in a very individualistic society. And I think with a lot, what I see with a lot of cooperative, worker cooperative development is that cultural attitudes really do, um, can help or hurt the, the development of a worker owned business and having this kind of common cause um, and like a cultural mindset that supports that common cause is really, is, is really helpful. And, and part of that is knowing that you're building something together that you won't benefit from like as a person right now, but you know it's going to benefit other people in the future, like people you care about in your community. So I think that's all, that's, my, that's it. Thank you, thank you, thank you, and thank you, Mai. Um, so we're gonna now switch over to discussion and Q&A, and I wanted to start us off, um, there's been some questions. I want to remind folks too, if you have questions, you can add them to the Q&A um, panel. Um, and I think um, Prague and I have been answering some of them. I want to start us off though with um, on the Q&A just by asking the question, what's your personal, what was your personal entry point into this work? Like, How did you personally get involved in um, building solidarity economies? Um, Mai, do you want to start? Um, sure, yeah, and I, I don't want to eat up into our Q&A too much, but um, I mean, it really at the heart of it, I saw 
how cooperation was really important for um, my community of mostly refugees um, and being resettled into the US and not having a lot of um, resources, um, financial capital, um, or even just access to lines of you know, political decision making, um, that it was really important for our community to cooperate. So like my mom ran a, a cooperative childcare, our family was a part of a cooperative lending circle um, to help people be able to buy homes and get out of um, the neighborhood that we had been resettled into. Um, and yeah, so from there, I just really think at the heart of it, um, see the power of cooperation. And um, when I went to college and was looking for affordable housing, which was very difficult in the Bay Area, I ended up finding um, housing cooperatives where, again, the same idea of working together um, to create a, a habitable, affordable space was really powerful to me in terms of thinking about, um, yeah, the impact on your day-to-day -day life um, and not just meeting the basic needs of housing and then also sharing food, but also the really cool things that we created together um, such as like a roof deck that looked out to the Golden Gate Bridge. <laughs> um, so seeing kind of the fun sides of cooperation as well and how it isn't just a way of um, surviving, but a really of helping us thrive together. And um, yeah, and I went on to also create a uh, cooperative restaurant in Canada. And um, yeah, I've just really carried the cooperative principles with me and found that like, um, we all just end up having much richer lives when we work together. So Anthu, and if you wanna go ahead. Sure, um, thanks Mai. Um, for me, yeah, I'd like to just kind of, my history is similar to Mai's history, it sounds like. Um, my mom did uh, cooperative childcare and um, for all the, the nail salon ladies in the neighborhood and of which there were many and um yeah it was just it wasn't you know i like when i got connected to the cooperative movement it it's just kind of the word cooperative was just never necessarily like a part of my language growing up it's just what you did um it was like it was just a fact of life like yeah you have to like look out for each other in order to survive that's what you do that's what we do in our community um the like the in Vietnamese like the gong um is like that's that's it that's what you do um it's the community that like ties you together and you know you need to borrow money or buy a car or like figure out how to get out out of this bad neighborhood that you're in um someone's gonna find a way to to make it happen help make it happen um bartering like my mother um like many people has a backyard um garden and she leverages every she leverages the hell out of it um and so you know i learned like both cooperative and solidarity economy principles from that in terms of self-sufficiency and um and also cooperation at the same time and then um professionally i like got into cooperatives uh on a, on a professional level in uh, when i lived in cambodia um and seeing how uh, artisans were using it as a way to um just like make their craft heard and bring it to the forefront um, and in so doing like empower themselves in their community. So. Thank you um, very much. Um, I, I just, uh, this reminds me of a, just a moment. Um, I went to um, the Mid-Atlantic uh, Agroecology um, gathering of uh, black and brown farmers and uh, Viet Lead, who we mentioned earlier, um, brought an elder um, to that gathering. Um, it was on the ancestral land of Harriet Tubman. And that elder just, you know, basically um, for about 25 minutes, 30 minutes, you know, went through this whole process of, of how she and her husband, you know, like use, found objects to create trellises, and all the techniques that they were using and all of the farmers were just completely, you know, taken by this. Um, and it just shows how much exchange and how much, you know, we can learn and kind of share. 
um, and it was you know deeply within the context of this you know um, cooperation um, you know both within you know the small community and in Camden that's growing um, and also you know across the whole mid-Atlantic so I totally appreciate that. Uh, we have some really great questions coming in. Uh, we tried to answer some by text. Um, uh, one of these questions, um, if you had a magic wand, how would you get these business models into the mainstream narrative? Um, does the narrative grow with the scale of the co-ops um, or are there other efforts to mainstream these ideas as uh, outgrowth from the resistance movement? Anyone who wants to take that? Um, yeah, I'll just start by saying that um, it's been really um, powerful to just build more cooperatives so that there's the proof of concept. Because um, I do work with a lot of small business associations and trying to integrate the, the co-op model into their suite of um, businesses that they discuss with clients and oftentimes they don't talk about co-ops because they don't believe that they work. And so as much as we can highlight that people are within cooperatives, um, the successes that come out of it, the, the economic, but also personal and social impacts, um, the more powerful. And there are efforts to now coordinate those stories and, and information so that we can present it to more business associations. Um, and extending from there, not just those associations and advisors, but also into schools, um, you know, business programs, um, but also any kind of like um, immigrant services, resettlement services. So anyone who talks about business to say like, hey, these are some examples, how they've worked, and then the resources that are available. Um, Anthu, do you have some? Sure. I think there's a, con a constant tension um, between cooperatives and also the world that we live in and work in. Um, so like you do have, you know, people in the cooperative spaces who are like, we don't want these to be, um, you know, principles to be diluted. I see one of the questions is about, you know, Sunkiss being a corporate cooperative. Um, one trend I think happened is that in the 1800s and early 1900s, when there were a lot of cooperatives, once like the modern corporate, um, you know, state emerged, uh, the corporate, you know, hegemony of America emerged, a lot of cooperatives were like, well, we shouldn't, you know, we should be, we should mainstream ourselves to be more like corporations, um, as opposed to the other way around. And now you're only now seeing some like cooperatives that are finally kind of emerging out of the closet, like REI, for example. Um, so I think a lot of it is like a, it, there's a, there's a, there's a cultural hunger to, um, that cooperatives should take advantage of, such as like, you know, the rise and in interest in social enterprise and social purpose businesses. But at the same time, like there is like understandably a skepticism that like, you know, if we try to mainstream ourselves, we're going to get, um, we're gonna get co-opted, if you can excuse the pun. Um, but at the same time, there there is a need for, for engagement. Um, we can't just like let ourselves be like another fringe movement if we wanna be successful. Right. Um, and, and I find, uh, I mentioned this at the first webinar that, you know, um, a lot of my uh, friends who've been really disheartened by the last year, um, you know, because they're in that space of resistance or in that space of um, um, defense, um, you know, this is an alternative, like this is a way to really think about building and, and what, you know, communities are already doing and, and ways in which uh, we can really, um, um, you know, um, uh, plant more seeds for that kind of work. Um, we do have some uh, questions that are still coming in. Thank you so much. Um, one of the questions um, was um, related to um, whether the moderators have uh, come across informal credit co-ops in the US. Um, and it says, in the Philippines, it's common for worker members to pool their money and members pay a modest fee to be able to borrow from that pool of money. Um, that's different from lending circles model, which is usually run by nonprofits. Um, do you, do you all have any examples of this that you've come across? Um, I mean, I know of like informal models where everybody pulls in money and then like they use that to, you know, it rotates in a person. Is, is that what they're speaking to? That's like found like a thing about, basically? Um, or are we talking about something that's like more formal as a means of like funding worker cooperatives and financing worker cooperative development? It seems like the question is um, 
related to like worker members within a co-op or within a um, mm -hmm. yeah and so whether there's something you know so some sort of like a uh, something that's related to the worker co-op or you know with them within the membership so yeah that does exist um some um worker cooperatives in the u.s um I believe Opportunity Threads is one of them, um, and uh, overseas do have something like that, where like the it's it's they have a they have a fund that's like part of the patronage, but you can you can borrow against that and pay it back. Mm -hmm. um, Maya, did you have any examples? Um, I yeah I I've heard of them. I guess there is a question of whether or not they're advisable, um, but uh, yes they. It do exist. I'm not sure if, if the person wants to follow up for particular examples of ones that have worked out. Um, I could share particular models and put them in touch with relevant people. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, a few. We're getting close to the end of our time. Um, a few other things I think that uh, come to mind are, um, you know, ways in which um, sometimes people really feel like, you know, we have to build this this cooperative that is doing everything. But I think Maya, you mentioned earlier. Um, you know, um, having uh, a cooperative, you know, related to equipment that you're using or tools that you're using, um, but there's so many different ways in which people can actually use these um, possibilities. And um, so within, um, I worked in direct services with different Asian uh, immigrant and migrant communities. Um, there's a lot of things that are happening informally, like, uh, like childcare and, um, you know, um, even uh, food in, in, you know, in a building that people are sharing um, meal, meal sort of services um, across the building. But I mean, you know, something as, that seems as basic as like the Chinatown vans in New York City that connected the, the different satellite Chinatowns. Um, you know, there were five or six Chinatowns when I was there. And um, those, you know, those vans, I mean, people are paying a dollar, but a dollar for the van, you know, it meets a need and it's a lot cheaper um, than using public transportation as direct. Um, so you could imagine if you had, um, you know, a youth program or if you had a program that worked with elders, that there's so many different things that, that um, service organizations could actually come up with. Um, and if you listen maybe to the community members themselves, they're probably doing some of this stuff already. So how can our nonprofits use grant money to also support these kinds of things? Um, and that kind of innovation, you know, is, is part of what we're also really interested in supporting. Um, okay. Um, we're really up against our time. Uh, we had one question here that just asked, uh, maybe as our closing question, um, how do you address people who are challenging cooperative culture, uh, particularly for worker co-ops when the work needs to get done, but certain folks aren't willing to put in the work? And I would say like advising co-ops and worker-owned co-ops, um, you know, the difference between being uh, an employee and then, um, you know, being an employee and an owner, you know, a member, uh, worker owner, um, your responsibilities are a little different um, and the way that you're oriented to the business and the success of the business is different. It's not a guaranteed paycheck, right? So I mean, no, no work is really guaranteed anymore. Um, do y'all have any, any feedback on that? I mean, I think it's just like, that's part of running a business. Sometimes you just have to, it's an, and management in it. Um, I think it's, you just have to reinforce that this is a, a shared, it's, it's a shared goal, it's a shared journey. Um, with a lot of worker cooperatives, they have um, a probationary period before you join the membership, um, just to just to prove yourself essentially. Um, but I think that's just, you know, it's part of the human condition, like you're going to run up against these things, people, people are people. Um, it's not a satisfying answer, I know, but um, hopefully like you know you have the structures in your um, worker cooperative that can deal with conflicts and that can handle with these um, with these issues that's part of governance okay well thank you so much um, we have run out of time uh, but thank you um, both uh, Mai and Antu for your really wonderful insight and uh, Yvonne also for um, uh, really guiding us through the the initial part of the solidarity economies framing uh, we are uh, again really really um, happy to see the interest in this we're continuing uh, the series on may 21st um, with a uh, webinar called forming cooperatives in which we'll be talking more about some of the uh, nuts and bolts of um, uh, structure and uh, um, some of the financial management you know questions and points um, some of which have come up today um, we just want to remind you to um, sign up for that webinar. 
we'll be sending out an email um, with uh, more details on how to um, you know, see the slides and uh, you know, uh, access this webinar recording. Um, so please let people know, because we would love for more people to know about the recording as well. Um, any feedback, we will be sending out a survey. We would really love to get your feedback um, because we do want this to reach as many people and, and be as useful as possible, and we're hoping to build on it. Um, again, many, many, many thanks to Antu and to um, Mai for your wonderful, um, for your time, your commitment, for the work you do, um, for the light that you bring in the world, um, for being in the community and, and being with us. Um, to Yvonne uh, for doing such wonderful work. The fact that this thing actually exists is thanks to you, Yvonne. And, um, and to um, our partners, UCLA Asian American Studies Center and uh, the National Coalition for Asian Pacific American Community Development. Um, we will also be sending out information about the organizations that we mentioned, um, in particular, Democracy at Work Institute and US Federation of Worker Co-ops. So if you can support, that'd be really wonderful. Thanks so much and have a wonderful rest of your day.